Nobody gives a fuck about Finland. But here you are anyway, because you saw Japan in the title and you got concerned over whether or not this is actually real. <laughs> you fucking weeb. Yes, you might have thought that this video is a joke, but it is not. In fact, it's very, very true. Finland is taking over Japan. Before we start, I would like to highlight that I have a small speech impediment. I tend to roll my R's when you're not supposed to. But with that out of the way, let's carry on with the video. Now, when most people think of taking over a country, they think of something like this. But in reality, there are several other ways of taking over a country. We can take control of the Soviet Union. Yes, measures and infiltration. У нас же был самый лучший советский сосед, чтобы научить все это. Так что мы знаем, как использовать такие тактики и стратегии. Эй, начальник, это все хорошо, что вы используете советские методы. Но зачем у тебя есть эстонский униформа, а? But indeed, that is how we're taking over Japan through active measures and infiltration. No need to have war when you can just convert the society to be on your side. Everyone knows that that is the best way to take over a country. But what are the ways in which Finland is taking over Japan? Well, in order for you to understand that, I'm gonna have to teach you some basic uh, political terminology. And the terminology in question is soft power a concept developed by the American political philosopher Joseph Nye in the 1990s. Joseph Nye argued that instead of hard power, which is economic and military pressure to make other countries do what you want, nations could instead rely on soft power. Soft power is about using one's cultural attractiveness to appeal to another nation and make them want to do things for you i.e. instead of pressuring other countries to do what you want under economic and military threats, you're so attractive as a nation that people want to do things for you. Basically, you're just turning a bunch of countries into your simps. Simp! Now you see, soft power isn't just dependent on cultural appeal alone. In fact, it's best to think of it as a kind of triforce. Each one of these aspects matters. At the bottom, you've got a nation's foreign policy and political values that are the foundation as to how well its cultural appeal at the top can spread to the world. Imagine if everyone's favorite South Korean boy band, BTS, was instead from North Korea. Yeah, you wouldn't be thinking so much about how, oh my god, Jimin is so hot, as much as you'd be thinking that, oh my god, are their families okay? Are they gonna be killed if they don't perform well tonight? You can argue that North Korea has cultural appeal as a country that's stuck in time. And you have some stupid tourists that go there and say that, oh, we've gone on a quirky adventure in a country that's lost in time, <laughs> without ever thinking why the country is stuck in time. It's because of its political values and foreign policy. You're dealing with a country that's a fucking dictatorship that oppresses its own people and puts them into death camps. And in terms of foreign policy, you're dealing with a country that has regularly flown intercontinental ballistic missiles over its neighbors, constantly threatens the world with nuclear war, and hacks everything worth of any monetary value on the internet. This is why North Korea is a pariah state. And that's why whatever cultural appeal it might have doesn't get spread to the rest of the world because its foreign policy and political values prevent that from happening. Now, in regards to Finland and Japan, these two countries complement each other extraordinarily well. Both countries share in their political values Western-style democracy, individual human rights, and freedoms. And, of course, they both have a high quality of life that a lot of people are jealous of. In regards to their foreign policy, both countries are relatively neutral actors in the world stage that want to promote peace and economic cooperation with their neighbors. This is why, in terms of soft power, both countries can actually easily permeate into one another. And that's exactly what we've been using in order to gain our advantage over Japan.
In order to understand how we've managed to infect Japanese society so deeply, you need to understand how we've managed to conjure up a positive image of ourselves amongst the Japanese. Firstly is the ease of assimilation of our values because of historical, geographical, and climate-related reasons. Both countries are geographically isolated. Japan is a string of islands at the end of Eurasia, and Finland is... Finland. In terms of climates, Japan is a natural disaster hotbed with tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, typhoons, etc. Meanwhile, Finland is over 70% forest and was one of the last regions of the earth to melt from the ice age, which has made growing any kind of agricultural products here extraordinarily difficult, not least because of a weather that can go down to minus 50 sometimes. So in terms of geography and climate, you've got two extraordinarily difficult environments to live in. And these, of course, will spawn people that understand the value of working together. Because if you don't work together and you don't come together in shared interests and shared values, you're all gonna die because of the nature that surrounds you. If you look at both Finland and Japan, you'll find that both of them have this mentality of being tough and not giving up. In Finland, the concept is known as Siso, which literally kind of translates to guts or backbone. In regards to Japan, you've got the ideas of gambatte and shogunai. Gambatte means do your best and good luck. On the other hand, shogunai is a little bit more complicated because it means both that there's no helping it, but it also means accept the situation and move on. It's about accepting the reality of the situation, rolling up your sleeves and getting back to work because the situation can't be helped. But hostile nature doesn't just forge tough personalities. It also commands respect. And in the case of both Japan and Finland, that respect comes in the form of native religions worshipping nature. Before Finland became a Christian country, Finns were pagan animist nature worshippers. They would worship the trees and the rocks and the animals around them, most specifically bears. Because bears were the most powerful animal around, they were also considered to be the most powerful spirits, and as such, Finns were primarily bear worshippers at the time. Surprisingly, bear worship has actually kind of made a comeback in recent years. And of course, in Japan's case, you have Shintoism, the native religion of Japan that worships nature as well. In their case, they believe that everything has a kami, a god. And of course, as a result of that, Japan is also nicknamed as the land of 8 million gods. In Shintoism, natural areas of spiritual power have to be protected. These include ancient trees, areas of significant natural beauty, and otherwise important or powerful areas that are deemed to be highly spiritual. This mutual appreciation for nature is why a lot of Japanese people consider Finland to be a kind of second home in Europe. It's a country that shares in their values of respecting nature and understanding its power. In this way, Finland and Japan share a religious connection with each other, despite not sharing in the exact same religion. And it's because of this connection that Finnish soft power values can assimilate themselves into Japan a hell of a lot easier than other countries' values. It's why, as you'll see later on in the video, Finnish nature-inspired fashion and design has become very, very popular in Japan. Secondly is the overall positive image of Finland as a country that kind of has it all. A country that can especially provide to the Japanese something that they lack in their own lives. As a country, we rank at the top of every possible list imaginable. Whether it's human development, freedoms, rights, hell, we've even managed to win the Happiest Country in the World Award for three years running. Not that I believe in that one much myself. And this has not gone unnoticed by the Japanese, who themselves are lacking in a lot of the things that we excel at. Namely, work-life balance and gender equality. It doesn't matter how you follow Japan, whether it's through YouTube and the J-vlogging community, through reading Japanese news or being on forums talking about Japanese travel. The point is, at some point, you surely have come across this term, karoshi. Karoshi literally translates to death from overwork, and it is one of the most tragic causes of death in Japan one that is specifically caused by a lack of a healthy work-life balance. You see, in Japan, what's important is not necessarily the fact that you are doing work, but more so the matter that you appear to be doing work. And that requires that you put your work first above your own well-being, above your family, and above your friends. Japanese working culture can pretty much be summarized with this. Hacho is coming. Look busy. 
This trend has been talked about ever since the 1990s economic bubble burst. It's an issue that still persists in Japanese society today and is actually, tragically, one of the main reasons why Finland is able to appear as such a good country in the eyes of the Japanese. Because we don't have cuddles. Other issues include social norms and pressures, such as the Japanese hierarchy system, which is extraordinarily difficult and high pressure to deal with. But it's not only in terms of work-life balance where we have an advantage over the Japanese. No, no. We also have an advantage in gender equality. Here in Finland, we love gender equality. Don't we, wifey? She's my complete equal, despite being made of plastic. I love you. If you look at any development index, you'll see that Japan ranks right at the bottom for gender equality. Because it is that bad. I mean, just recently, a figure of the Japanese government had to resign because of sexist comments that he had made openly against his colleagues. I'm not saying that Finland is perfect in this regard. We've got issues in work-life balance and gender equality too. But they're much healthier than they are in Japan. So with all of these things going on in Japanese society, is it any wonder that they look to us as a country that has the solutions to their problems? I mean, just check out these videos where these Japanese presenters are coming in to learn more about the Finnish system, whether it is in terms of education or just our way of life. <laughs> of course, Finland is also renowned for its more quirky side that hasn't gone unnoticed in a quirky country like Japan. Whether it's hobby horse racing or whether it's air guitar world championships or wife carrying competitions, these are things that the Japanese have become enamored by simply because there's another country that's as quirky as them out there. All of this can be generally summarized as a general Japanese fascination into the Finnish way of life and into the Finnish life lessons and life values. And there is one tool that we have used that has been more efficient and more effective than any other in spreading this into the minds of the Japanese. Are you ready for the grand reveal? This is our most powerful weapon. No, it's not an artist's rendition of an arctic hippopotamus. Such a creature does not exist. This is a Moomin. Specifically, this character is Moomin Troll, from the eponymous series of books created by Fenno-Swedish author Duve Jansson. The novels were heavily inspired by Duve Jansson's own experiences growing up in Finland, and as such, they contain a lot of the life lessons based on Finnish values. To say that the Moomins are popular in Japan would be an understatement. In fact, just look at the sheer number of Moomin stores in Japan, like dedicated Moomin stores. Hell, there's even a move in kindergarten! I mean, if that's not brainwashing the masses at a young age, then I don't know what that is. In order for you to understand just why the Moomins are so popular in Japan, we need to go back in time to the 1960s and the 1970s. It all began with the release of the Japanese animation Moomin on Fuji TV in 1969. The first half of the series was made by TMS Studio and A Productions, with the latter half being made by Mushi Productions the studio headed by the godfather of manga, Osamu Tezuka himself. Produced by Shigehito Takahashi and directed by Masaki Osumi, the series was first aired in October 1969 during Fuji TV's evening slot on Sundays from 7.30 to 8.00 p.m. As you can imagine, this is a prime time slot. At this time, families were usually having dinner or finishing dinner and watching TV together in the background or together as a family, as a leisurely activity. As a result, the show of course very quickly becomes a hit, because it also touches upon topics that the Japanese are not used to seeing. It was highly praised for being different. The series was so successful that it was able to gain a sequel, Shin Moomin, in 1972. But ironically, Tove Jansson herself hated both the 1969 Moomin and the 1972 Shin Moomin. The reason for this was because of the numerous changes that the anime had done to the characters, to the themes of the stories, to the plots, and to the various events in her novels. I mean, <laughs> just take a look at some of this insanity from the 1960s anime. <laughs> Who 
の顔をなめさすんだ Remember, the novels were supposed to be for the whole family to enjoy. They were supposed to be for children as well as adults. The 1960s anime was anything but. It's a wild ride. <laughs> The series was as a result never translated or shown outside of Japan. However, this doesn't change the fact that an entire generation of Japanese families grew up watching the movement. And with the 90s, the Japanese economic bubble burst, people's lives went to shit, and Joel Kosai became a thing, and anime became more mainstream than ever with some very, very cool titles in between. And with the anime spread came the new movement animation. This time closely watched over by Tove Janssen, given her negative experiences with the previous movement series. Produced by Telecable Benelux, later renamed Telescreen, the new animation was a hybrid effort by the Japanese, Finns, and the Dutch. The 90s anime is actually called Taoshi Moomin Ikka, or Delightful Moomin Family, and it aired on TV Tokyo from April 1990 to October 1991. It was an astounding success. The Moomin animation not only got a sequel, but it also got a movie adaptation called Comet in Moomin Land, as well as several video game adaptations. Heck, the latest of these video game adaptations came out in 2009 for the Nintendo DS. It was so successful that it created a phenomenon known as the Moomin Boom. Thin airplanes were painted with Moomin liveries, merchandise was being made and sold everywhere, and to top it off, a Moomin World was opened in Nantali in 1993. Did you know that Moomin World Nantali is famous for the sheer number of Japanese fans that make pilgrimages there, in some cases every year? The success of the Moomin World in Nantali amongst Japanese fans has been so great that the Moomin Corporation decided to build another Moomin Park in Japan. It's located in Saitama Prefecture and is actually just called Moomin Valley Park. And it's been in operation since 2018. Now you're probably thinking, okay, it's a children's cartoon that was popular with two generations of Japanese families. So why are the Japanese so obsessed with it? The Japanese love everything cute and cuddly looking. It's an integral part of the Japanese kawaii culture. It's the same reason why Hello Kitty is popular. It's cute! Hell, you could even make the argument that the Moomins resemble Totoro, a much beloved character in Japanese anime. The movie for Totoro did only come out two years before the Moomin anime. The second is the fact that anime in the 1990s was something that the Japanese were getting heavily invested in. This was a time when anime started to get really experimental and a whole new host of shows with all kinds of genres started flowing in. Meaning, a family-oriented show about a bunch of cute creatures going around was able to hit the right niche at the right time in the right market. The third, and probably most importantly, is the fact that the Moomin stories contain a lot of life lessons that were intrinsically valuable to the Japanese, and struck a chord with them. Understand that in the 1990s, much of the social fabric that had previously defined Japan had completely broken down. It was why the 90s are known as the Lost Decade. In fact, to get an idea of the doom and gloom that people felt at the times, look no further than the movie Battle Royale. So with all of the bad stuff happening, it makes sense that people would be attracted to a show of cute and cuddly creatures going around their daily lives and having adventures in a fantastical and mysterious world. Hell, it's the same reason why isekai shows have become so popular and here to stay in the anime community, and why VTubers have become the hottest thing since Spider-Man and Elsa videos. People want to be entertained by things that don't remind them of their own shitty and miserable lives. As such, the Moomins are arguably the greatest propaganda product that Finland has ever produced in trying to promote the image of Finland abroad. And we didn't even do it on purpose, which makes it twice as great, because that means that everything is happening organically from the ground up. The people are brainwashing themselves. Allow me to remind you of some basic facts. Finland is a country of only 5.5 million people and is around the 43rd most powerful economy in the world. Meanwhile, Japan has a population of over 125 million and is the third most powerful economy in the world. So imagine when the country the size of Japan has over 23 pro-Finland friendship societies spread all throughout the country. And in addition, there's another 14 Finland-related societies in areas such as music and literature. 
Seven of these are in Tokyo alone. All of these associations directly influence Japanese civil society, and they contribute to the positive image that Finland enjoys amongst the Japanese. And this isn't even the most direct way in which we're influencing Finnish society. As I mentioned earlier, Finland is world-renowned not just for its work-life balance, but also for its gender equality. And a big part of this is the care towards women that Finnish society provides. Perhaps most importantly, in maternity care and child care. The Moomin Kindergarten I mentioned earlier? Ha! <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg. We are literally impacting how children are being born in Japan. Japan is currently suffering through one of the worst declining birth rates in any Western developed nation. And in an effort to try and help people have kids, the Japanese government came knocking at our door, asking us for help. And of course, in our graciousness, we provided that help to them. Allow me to introduce you to the Neuvola. The Neuvola is essentially a Finnish maternity care center. And these are essentially called by their actual Finnish name in Japan. These maternity care centers operate more or less in the exact same manner as they would in Finland. Nevolas, literally meaning advice centers, are places where families can go to for all matters relating to family planning. From planning to have a child, to prenatal care, to postnatal care, to together time with other moms with their children, and overall spending time together with the family, the Neuvola is a place where all members of the family can come to for advice. Specifically, it is of course primarily designed for mothers, but fathers are welcome and in fact encouraged to come too. At Neuvola's, mothers also get a Japanified version of the famous Finnish baby box. A package that includes everything needed to take care of a baby from the moment they're born. The current number of Neuvolas is estimated to be around 700, and they keep on increasing because their value is that high. They are that helpful to families, especially in a country with a declining birth rate like Japan. The Neuvola might look something a little bit like this. Aberashi-san, konnichiwa! Ah, konnichiwa! O genki desu ka? Ma, ima wa genki desu yo ne. この子は最近生まれたんだから。おめでとうございます。いい子ですよね。なんて可愛い子ですよね、これは。可愛い息子だよな。この子の名前は何ですか?まあ実はこの子の名前はまだお父様。え、いや、ちゃ、喋ったの
the modern Japanese parliament. He also got re-elected in 2007, by the way, serving for a total of 11 years before losing the 2013 election. Despite whatever criticisms one might have of his politics, the fact that the first foreign-born MP in Japan is from Finland is a huge deal. It means that the image of Finland in Japan was so positive already in the early 2000s that people would gladly vote for the Finnish Gaikokujin, even though it might have only been a protest vote. And with that kind of track record, who knows what would happen if a new Finnish-born person decided to get involved in Japanese politics? In essence, these are all of the ways in which Finland is directly influencing civil society in Japan and is directly contributing to how society is being run in the country. I think with this it's becoming quite clear just how deeply we've managed to infiltrate inside of the Japanese society and how we are taking control. Je ne sais pas combien de paysans qui regardent cette vidéo comprennent le concept de la nationalisme banal. Le nationalisme banal veut dire simplement qu'on prend contrôle de l'image de la nation en présentant des choses nationalistes à la quotidienne. Et c'est surtout ici où les Finlandais ont eu des succès énormes avec leur envahissement du Japon. What the French guy just said. What you need to understand is that in our taking over of the country, it's not just been with radical governance related programs and taking over civil society and putting our politicians into the mix. No, no. We have been able to corrupt every single aspect of daily life in Japanese culture to the point where theirs is slowly being melded with our own. The first step, of course, to any nationalization program, whether it be Russification, Americanization, or in this case, Finlandization, is the control of the language. And what better way to permeate a language through a people than through music? In regards to music, there is of course one particular song that has managed to break through into Japan unlike any other. It is a song that has been remixed with a particular program that has a particular character as its mascot that has a worldwide audience. You know exactly who it is. I'm talking about Yeva Polka and the Hatsune Miku remix. <laughs> Let me give you a short rundown of the history of Yevan Polka and how it spread to Japan. It was first created in 1928 by the Finnish songwriter Eino Gettomen. In 1995, the song was covered by the Finnish a cappella group Loituma, and it was this version that became world famous. And the way the Loituma version became super viral across the internet was in 2006 with the Leak Spin meme. The Leak Spin meme involves the character Orihime Inoue from the series Bleach just singing this song while she's spinning a leak. And it was thanks to this meme that the song became covered by every possible artist from every possible genre underneath the sun. Most famously, by a certain Vocaloid artist by the name of Otomania. Otomania's version has been such a hit that it has since been used as an official tutorial in the Hatsune Miku Project Diva Rhythm Game series. And since then, the Hatsune Miku version has gotten thousands upon thousands of re-uploads and remixes, the most popular of which has over 50 million views on YouTube. So, needless to say, Finnish music is clearly very popular amongst the Japanese. But it's not just in the realm of anime music where we're flexing our muscles, it's also in the realm of classical music and heavy metal. Remember those music-related friendship societies that I talked about? Yeah. John Sibelius is a regular icon of inspiration amongst Japanese classical music artists. And of course, the society of John Sibelius is very, very active in Japan, promoting Finnish classical music at every chance it gets. But of course, in the outside world, Finland is most well known for heavy fucking metal. And that's exactly what we've shown success in in Japan too. A lot of Finnish bands have actually been able to hit that Japanese heavy metal niche. Not just because of the melodical quality of heavy metal music, but also because of the lyrical aspect of Finnish heavy metal bands. Finnish bands such as Mokoma, Stamina, Amorphis, Sonatartika, Children of Bodom all have managed to make it big in Japan. And they have such a fan following there that the fans themselves actually learn the lyrics in Finnish so that they can be able to sing along during the live shows of the bands. In fact, in Tokyo, there's a bar dedicated to heavy metal called the Psy Bar. Because of the pandemic, I'm still not sure whether or not this place is open. Psy Bar was hailed as a place where fans of Finnish heavy metal could come and congregate and share their interests. 
and what's especially of note is the owner himself, who was able to sing the lyrics to Terras Betoni without any problem. <laughs> Teres Betoni is another famous Finnish power metal band, by the way. Oh, and of course, I forgot to mention that we have a Finland Music Fest happening every single year in Tokyo that features the very best of Finnish music. So as you can see, we're very much involved in the Japanese music industry as well. But music, of course, is not the only way in which we are connected to the Japanese. You see, for one language to be able to easily permeate into another, there have to be some certain similarities. You would think with such extensive differences as a syllabic versus phonetic alphabet, three writing styles versus one, that there are no similarities between Finnish and Japanese. But that's where you're wrong! For starters, despite the differences in the alphabet, what with Japanese being syllabic and Finnish being phonetic, the pronunciation of the letters themselves is actually remarkably similar. So for example, in English, where you have A, E, I, O, and U, in Finnish and Japanese, you have A, E, E, O, and U. Although, of course, Japanese is a little bit softer than Finnish. The biggest similarity is not just in pronunciation, though. It's actually in terms of grammar, because both languages conjugate the endings of words in order to fit the sentence. To give you an example of how these two languages are grammatically similar, allow me to use the sentence Did you give that? I will give it now. In Japanese, the sentence would be Sore wo agemashita no desu ka? Ima agemasu. And in Finnish, it would be Annoitko sinä sen? Annan sen nyt. So in both cases, you can see that the word to give is the one that gets conjugated. In Japanese, to give is ageru or agemasu if you're speaking formally. So this is the word that gets transformed from agemashita to agemas. And of course in Finnish, to give is anta, which in the case of the sentence was did you give, anmoitko, and that gets transformed into I will give, annan. So that's how these two languages are similar. It has been long known that the Japanese love all kinds of fashion and arts related to nature. And hell, that's exactly what we're good at too! Hell, in recent times, there's been a huge rise in the kind of Nordic minimalist style within Japan. And design artists all over the world in terms of furniture and architecture have actually tried to combine a kind of Nordic Japanese aesthetic. Finnish design is heavily inspired by its nature and beauty. And it's been a great source of brands and design houses such as Itala, Arabia, Bentik, Kauniste. But truly the best example of Finnish nature-inspired design and its permeation into the Japanese lifestyle is through Marimekko. Here's the total list of Marimekko shops in Japan. There's 37 of them all over the country. They've also done a collaboration with Uniqlo that went super viral. And Japanese tourists regularly visit Helsinki's Marimekko outlet in the Hertonemi area all the time. In fact, I would argue that Japan is Marimekko's single most important country of operations in terms of customer loyalty and revenue. Of course, here we again see the importance of the ease of language. Marimekko is very easy to pronounce in Japanese. If people didn't know that Marimekko is from Finland, they could actually believe that it's Japanese, because it sounds Japanese. But it's not just Marimekko that sounds Japanese. In fact, a lot of Japanese fashion brands have decided to take on Finnish names in order to appear exotic and appeal to the Japanese consumers. And this is again because Finnish is easy to pronounce for a lot of Japanese people. The best example I can give are the stores Ehkä Söpö, Mina Perhonen, and Otan Tämän. Respectively, these mean Maybe Cute, I Butterfly, and I Will Take This. This shows how easily Finnish is permeating into the Japanese language. And hey, who knows, maybe soon all those anglicisms that Japan's suffering from will be replaced with fennocisms. But it's not just in the realm of music, language and fashion that we are permeating into Japan. That's right, Finland is taking over the manga and animation industry. Don't believe me? Here's a list of all of the manga and anime that I was able to list off the top of my head that feature Finland in one way or another. Remember the basic fact that we are 23 times smaller than Japan. And through these characters, we've managed to show that we inspire artists and creators within a billion dollar industry. But you see, it's not just in terms of anime and manga that we're influencing popular culture in Japan. There are in fact a number of movies as well that have been filmed in Finland that have become 
Cult Hits. There is a famous Japanese cult film known as Kamome Shokudo, which literally translates to The Seagull Restaurant. Based on Yoko Mure's novel of the same name, Kamome Shokudo is a 2006 film directed by Naoko Ogigami. The film is shot entirely in Helsinki and features a Japanese woman trying to run a Japanese-themed diner in the heart of Helsinki. The movie was such a hit, in fact, that the real-life restaurant where the movie was filmed in Helsinki changed its name to Ramintola Kamome, or Restaurant Seagull. And in fact, it remains a popular tourist attraction for Japanese visitors coming to Helsinki. But there's also a more recent film that has made some success in Japan. The movie I'm talking about is the 2019 romance film Yuki no Hana, or Snow Flower. It was directed by Kojiro Hashimoto and takes inspiration from the singer Mika Nakashima's song of the same name. The movie was released in Japan on February 1st in 2019, and it was able to gross a whopping 1.12 billion yen at the box office. The filming of this movie was huge news in Finland, because half of the film was shot in Finland, with two different seasons being filmed, February and June. This movie was of course a fantastic hit, and served as a great propaganda tool for Finnish tourism amongst Japanese visitors. But popular culture and banal nationalism also includes the realm of sports. And it is in sports that something from Finland has just made the Japanese go absolutely crazy. This is a game similar to French pétanque that is called Mölk. It's actually played pretty much in the exact same way. But instead of using round metal balls, you are using just blocks of wood with points marked on them. It's thanks to the YouTuber Gen Takagi that I was actually even made aware of the fact that Melku has become such a thing in Japan. You really should go watch Gen's video on how Melku became popular if you can speak Finnish. It's a really good video. But for those of you who don't speak Finnish and just want a quick summary, Melku basically spread in Japan thanks to the efforts of comedy troops. Coming across Melku by sheer coincidence, the comedy troupe Sandwich Man then introduced this to the Sarawa Seishi no Hikari comedy troupe of which the member Morita took an especially strong liking to the game. Morita can be considered the godfather of Melku in Japan, in the sense that he's really the person that spread it throughout the country. You see, he featured it in a lot of his comedy shows, and also formed the Japanese national Melku team to be able to compete in the French international championships. Don't ask me why French people love Melku, it's a topic for another video, and I would love to go and find out why. You know it's beautiful when some of the most skilled video game and content creators in the world get this excited about throwing a few blocks of wood around. Bathing is an essential element of the national identity for both Finland and Japan. Both of them have a long history with bathing. But of course, where Japan is a geothermal paradise and has hot springs all over the country, Finland has no such things, and so we were forced to innovate. And innovate, we did. Allow me to introduce you to the sauna, the most popular and the hottest item in the Japanese bathing market right now. It says a lot that a country with a rich and abundant hot spring culture is being enthralled by saunas. There's already over 7,000 of them registered throughout the country. For example, Japan has an annual Finland Sauna Festival that has seen increased membership with each passing year. There's also this mad lad and a few others that have actually built their own Finnish style saunas by hand in the middle of Japanese wilderness. There's even a word that has been thrown around for describing the feeling that a sauna provides to customers. The word is totono, which means I'm refreshed. Of course, in terms of language, there's the quintessential word from Finland, lol, which has been appropriated into the Japanese lexicon. Hell, the sauna craze is so popular that even Yamaha is in on it. You know, the guys that manufacture everything from engines to instruments. I mean, just look at this website. There's ads, several manga series, and of course, for all you weebs out there, go check out the Yurukamp special episode that features this particular manga chapter. There's even a website called Sauna Ikitai, which means I want to go to a sauna, which is essentially a search engine of all of the registered saunas in Japan. That's crazy. So yes, this is how Finlandization is taking place in Japan and how we are overwriting the daily life and cultural banal elements of Japan with our own. So, as you can see, the silent invasion of Japan is almost complete. 
It's just a matter of time until the land of the rising sun has become completely part of the land of the midnight sun. And if it wasn't for this stupid pandemic, we would have already taken over the country. But no matter. We're already in so deep that revealing our secrets at this point is perfectly fine. In all seriousness, thank you very much for watching this video. I know that it's quite long, but I hope that if you were not entertained, then at least you learned something new, and maybe you uh, found some interesting points that you never thought about before. And of course, because I haven't spoken much Finnish in this video, I've got to give you a proper Finnish send-off. Nähdä pelkälle ens kerralla! Finally done with the project. Uh, guess I'm gonna be going on vacation now. Oh, hey, what's up? I'm afraid to report we have a problem, sir. What, what, do, what do you mean? It's about the invasion of Japan, sir. I'm afraid it's not been possible. What do you mean, what's- I'm afraid the truth has been leaked out, sir. They know we don't exist. <laughs> Come on, don't joke with me. Of course we exist, why? Where else would we have the flag and the outfit and, and everything? Sir. I'm afraid that this is all an illusion. We're a construct by the Japanese. Please see the Reddit theory for yourself if you do not believe me. You're serious? Hang on. 